Hi, folks. Really nice to see all of you. Really especially nice to see you, Tom. I'm going to flatter you a little bit and introduce you. And then um, we're going to pass the mic uh, to Tom. He's going to give us a bit of an overview. He actually created this. Um, uh, is it a subway map of Tokyo? It was initially. Now it's not anymore. <laughs> So now it is um, uh, an um, uh, illustration of the, the various um, aspects that uh, have to be put together in order to uh, um, uh, define the next generation um, vehicles and mobility uh, architectures. Uh, he's going to go a little bit into that. And um, then we move into fireside chat mode. That means that um, you know, we're going to pretend you guys are a fire and, um, and we're chatting. But we also want to um, invite the fire to participate. So um, uh, please do think about um, uh, questions, things that um, uh, interest you. Take it as a as an opportunity to uh, um, you know take the microphone in a setting like that. Um, it's actually really important to just get used to having a microphone and um, you know having chats with uh, people in public. I think that is very useful. So with um, that little teaser, let me go back to um, say hello also to our audience online. Welcome to this um, uh, CME talk. CME stands, of course, for software um, in automotive and mobility ecosystems. And um, we're developing this curriculum here in Wolfsburg together with our partners, our fellows, in order to offer it to anybody who wants to be part of the next generation software engineers in this space. And especially for um, those here, the 42 students, uh, once you've passed the uh, core curriculum, you can join 42 Mobility, which is a, a derivative, um, a variation of the bigger CME program. But obviously, especially when you're here in Wolfsburg, you'll be interacting with the CME students and the fellows. And um, the, the newest thing on the block is that we're looking for an actual lab, an additional space here in Wolfsburg to um, have those who are studying in that direction come together with the fellows and hack and build and solder and um, laser cut, whatever it needs. Um, uh, we are looking forward to make that happen. So the first cohort can start in that space in uh, the very beginning of July. Do check out cme.space if you have not done so, I'm sure. Um, the colleagues have put some stuff in the description for this event. But without further ado, let's um, uh, talk a little bit about Tom. Tom, um, uh, I have to say you are uh, a real phenomenon in um, the, the Volkswagen automotive world um, uh, because uh, it, it was basically, I'm, I'm sorry to embarrass you, but love at first sight. We got together, we started to chat, and a couple of weeks later we stand here because Tom is a... Um, full on open source in automotive um, promoter, strategist, actual hands-on coder. Obviously he does have a, a background in coding, first in pizza um, uh, and then um, he moved pretty quickly to uh, um, uh, go to the entrepreneurial side and um, offer software companies that had a job opening to say, hey, um, I'm seeing you're looking for a software engineer, I'm a student but um, maybe I can um, uh, help you and get started with that coding project. I thought that was particularly inspiring for uh, the students, right? Probably a pretty smart idea to land some freelance gigs and, uh, and add something to your um, monthly budget. Um, uh, then, of course, there was uh, official um, uh, software engineering studies. I hope it was not too painful. Um, uh, I hope you can yeah, see yeah. that um, our students um, uh, do feel the pain of um, debugging and other um, uh, necessary elements, but we, I think, relieved them of a significant part of the more academic and, um, yeah, um, well, theory things that you don't necessarily need when you just want to write code. Uh, but that's what you have been doing um, for a long time uh, at Electrobit, um, uh, one of the um, uh, really cutting edge um, software development uh, firms here in Germany in the automotive sector. And now for uh, quite some time already at uh, Carriot, one of our um, dear partners. And uh, rather than um, 
me going on and on and on. I would like to pass it to you to um, compliment Thanks. and uh, contradict what I just said and uh, maybe share a little bit about your role in Carriot, what you're doing right now. Thanks, Max. And uh, great pleasure to be here with all of you guys, as well as uh, guys on video. Robert, nice to see you again remotely somewhere behind me. Now it's really great. And I'm kind of embarrassed because I normally don't really need or get any such praise here for stuff like, you know, long time ago as a student, uh, as he said, I was baking pizza in the first semester and found out ah, it's kind of, it was the night shifts. You always miss the first class. Um, so I actually started coding and uh, for instance, uh, worked uh, on Java micro edition and did um, uh, Kino lottery gamings for uh, Lotto Deutschland. Um, and actually, I had the pleasure to go to BZGRDE and present these apps there and they said, ah, mobile gaming, that's addictive, we're forbidding that, you know, I was back in 2002. Um, so I made my experience here and you know where we are with mobile gaming and free to play and pay to win. Um, I think this is around the corner. And here then I moved into programming. Um, but faster than I expected out of that into product management and really looking around the globe, selling software, telling others what we should develop, things like that. So it was really a very inspiring time and very interesting time. And now I'm really happy to be at Carriot, um, doing pioneering work for the Volkswagen Group in terms of enabling us in the whole software ecosystem. And open source is a key aspect as well for not all of the software of Carriot, but for a certain ever getting huger amount of software that we're having in the car. Therefore, we as well joined Eclipse SDV, um, not to build one monolithic big thing that solves all our problems, a silver bullet, but really to create assets that we can use um, throughout the industry and as well can collaborate with um, other car makers, with tier ones, um, with technology providers throughout the industry. Because you sure know, antitrust laws forbid that just two or three make a club do something together in secret, and open source really prevents that as well. So you're yeah. Already going deep. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm going deeper. Deep into sub, uh, substance, as uh, I know he always does. But um, uh, share a little bit more about your, your path. So Electrobit uh -huh. was great. Yeah. Now, um, what keeps you oh. up at night? What, um, <laughs> how, how do you run your team? I know you're uh, you. running a team of actual hardcore software engineers and carry it. Um, how, how is that? How does that uh, feel? Uh -huh. do, you, do you think uh, some of these ladies and gentlemen um, uh, might be interested? Yeah. Okay. Um, about my past, you know, I, I'm still in the Chaos Computer Club and sometimes I like to fiddle around with gear and, and do stuff, you know, but I'm definitely not anymore anything like you would call a professional software engineer. But these are the guys I hired in my team. Um, who really do everything uh, along what we call the recycle, you know, like think about the system, define, okay, architecture wise, this makes sense for us to meet response times, requirements, uh, size budgets of, uh, of RAM and CPU, um, exploit Linux or AOSP to the fullest, and then actually writes the design, codes the stuff, makes the tests to make this happen. So I, you know, really one, one moment uh, last week where I really said, Wow, that was cool. It was one guy from my team. Um, and I don't want to embarrass him now, but he came and said, you know what, for the some IP stack, I found a component um, in the open source um, from Meta, Facebook, basically. Awesome component for networking. And I'm already kind of, you know, I'm, I'm halfway finishing this thing. Um, very, very, really see, okay, that's kind of obviously cool to, to uh, see these guys looking throughout research papers, throughout industry papers, throughout the rest of the open source community to find solutions for that. Um, and th therefore, we are we're building that team. We started in Nuremberg, basically, um, our office um, with my development team. Um, pretty small, basically. In the start, we, I had three guys in my team and then ramped up to now 15. A couple of them are in Wolfsburg. Um, but the, let's say the guys who really code are kind of in the area of 15 people right now. Um, and they're already making good, good progress, working 
with Rust, with C++ on Linux, on the actual target system. So on their desks, they are having B samples is what we call that. So already in automotive housing with the proper cooling and the connectors, um, the actual target hardware sitting next to their desk connected with a Raspberry Pi that serves either as a USB stick or as a, as a relay controller to reboot the actual device and then flash software on that as soon as Jenkins or GitHub Actions are done. Um, so it's really inspiring seeing that this team can, can achieve these things, you know? That's kind of, you know, cool. Very cool. So I'll um, pass you that um, seat for the moment when you mm -hmm. um, uh, share a bit about yeah. your um, uh, subway strategy or um, the architecture of um, the software defined vehicle. So you could call this map a little bit buzzword bingo to some extent, if you see it negative. Um, but on the positive side, it really depicts most of the software that we're having to do. Um, so now I'm back on the mic. Oh, this little map here um, kind of grow over the years, you know? That's not one thing you do just uh, in an afternoon. And for instance, it tells you here on the cloud computing area, it's a yellow one, uh, stuff from infrastructure as code mastering, basically the backend infrastructure, deploy services, and it kind of goes line in line next to the embedded part here, where cloud connectivity gateway software that uploads and downloads, um, data, software updates, map updates, IDS data um, to the backend. Um, goes here along with several topics um, like mastering the MQTT protocol to get a secure backend connection or let's say an IoT-like backend connection, MQTT per such not. Uh, to yeah, really um, piloted drive, uh, getting from doing recalls into pre-calls because you potentially have uh, data ahead of time for, for preventing that. So a couple of use cases listed on this one. Um, but the core part where I am working on right now is really what we call our software platform for VOS with my guys. Um, and that is on the embedded line here. So you see a ton of stuff that you could focus on or that is very good to master if you're into automotive software on the embedded line. That's the obvious part um, because we are there is a slogan in the industry that the car is a data center on wheels, but it's not. The car is not a data center on wheels. You don't have racks of servers. You have a number of very restricted electronic control units, which have been installed initially there and have already been overloaded uh, with software so that you barely can schedule the tasks in the Artos systems. Um, and it's two tons heavy and can drive up to 200 kilometers or faster. So it can kill people. It's a distributed safety system in itself with sometimes online connectivity, less so in Germany than in other countries, sometimes I would say. Um, but nevertheless, it's not a data center, though there is good stuff from the cloud that you could apply to the vehicle, but you need to be critical as well on that. So there are a ton of stuff on the embedded line here from safety engineering, which is a good thing that everybody should know of who works in uh, automotive to a, a good extent. Um, it's not just the CAN bus that we're having here um, for communication between the control units. It's as well Ethernet and other protocols um, that are running there. And I don't want to stop on every station here. Otherwise, I talk for hours and hours. Um, the green line is as well an important one for all engineers and sure for you as well as students here. Um, about security and security, not in the sense of um, fear, uncertainty and doubt like food, which is very prominent in the security space where people say, oh, we need to make this secure or we need here cyber snake oil, which is a term that if you're kind of, if you're in the chaos computer club and follow the guys, a lot of the stuff may be snake oil. We should not do that. Um, so start should be proper security engineering, being aware of what is the risk that your system is exposed to? What could an attacker do? What are the requirements to prevent this? To really implement these requirements, put them in architecture and do a kind of less cyber hyped, but a solid security engineering along while you develop. And then certification and these things as well will be way easier. And that may involve then having secure boot, 
up to incident response on the cloud side. If you look on the very far end of the cloud security part, you should be aware that your data that you store there may be away somewhere. Um, so what do you do then? Don't panic, have engineered what you do beforehand, stuff like that. So the map is huge and my part is just <laughs> on this one here. Sure, there's innovation. We try to innovate quite a lot, but we come to that and take some part of software uh, ownership. But my part on this huge map currently is just the software platform um, where we are working on. I so far to the map. Um, yeah, not maybe, maybe you can uh, zoom out uh, for, oh, yeah. for a moment. Uh, I've looked at this thing for quite a while and I know Pratik and um, the folks that are working on our learning projects have as well. I mean, it is, um, Fair to say that it's a bit overwhelming. Oh yeah, and you know the fact that Adas is this one little thing down <laughs> there, for example, you know, just gives you an idea of the depth of um, yeah. the, the map and where um, each one of those um, stops of those stations yeah. actually um, unfold and, uh, and have a whole world in itself. Now, um, the the question. Um, I thought it would be nice for us to open the conversation is uh, to see um, it's a never ending story to, uh, to write software, right? You start and then you evolve, right? You iterate um, version one, two, three, 200, and, and then maybe at some point you have to do a complete refactoring, complete relaunch. But um, right now, uh, you had a conversation a couple of days ago where you shared that um, you're actually um, doing what you preach um, in open oh, yeah. source, which is um, release early and often, right? I think one of the um, changes that is happening um, compared to the old world where basically people collaborated for five years, I think is a, is a normal time before a new mm -hmm. um, car type gets out to have the software and everything, the whole package ready, and then it goes out, right? And um, what you talked about was bringing some parts of um, uh, what you're planning for in a couple of years already into the cars right now. And um, I, that, that for me was a sign that Carriot is start, uh, really getting it, that yeah. uh, there is a new mindset that is coming out and uh, basically that the software engineering um, uh, mindset is um, piercing through some of the more traditional thinking and the more traditional mm -hmm. approaches. Can you um, share a little bit about that, please? Oh yeah, yeah, I can. Um, but needs to, it needs, it's it's a very um, uh, you need to look for on on this thing from a different angles. Um, so there will ever be the the timing where we need to be ready and deliver um, towards the SOP, where everything needs to be flashable and producible as well for the factory guys. Though that if you put the whole um, connected ECUs together, none of the error codes show up. The communication is stable, it's robust. It's as well robust if you restart it and it must be as well robust if the car would run without interruption on battery just for days and months. So you should not ever have any memory overrides and stuff like that. No, so no rebooting this, at 200 km. Huh? Exactly. So you, you will ever have this, you know. Um, so change comes in when we are now having more of our software in their own control that we can see, okay, the software is not for us a black box that we just received together with a piece of hardware um, and uh, just stood next to it based on test cases and specification and the rest of the V model was hidden to us, but really with own engineers who debug on the system, who have communication protocols, who have middleware components, as well as the functional components on their hand and can integrate this in automated fashion. Um, and then really have confidence in order to deploy it, you know, and this then uh, does it change. Therefore, I said we are already having our very first software components, which are coming in one or two, um, definitely. Um, and we're as well picking and taking stuff from what we did for the future of 2.0 and uh, planning out right now, um, even though some of it may come in the first SOP, but others as well. You, if you bring out a car, you have follow-up clusters where 
additional car models kind of go to market. So you have these follow-up clusters where um, you then, if you have the confidence and the automated tests and these things, um, deploy a new software as well then in follow-up clusters. So I think I got it. I'm not quite sure if um, all of the audience is as deep into uh, some of the um, uh, concept that, that you mentioned, like an SOP, maybe you can oh, yeah. uh, abstract a little bit higher and um, uh, also get um, uh, our audience to, to follow um, mm -hmm. uh, the 1.0, the 1.12 oh, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. and uh, the two, just to um, oh, yeah. um, have everybody so, on the same page. So this numbering is really, um, for an outsider must be really complex in, in this regards, definitely. Um, so what, uh, if you read it as well in the media, what we're talking about 1.2 is the current SOP, which is, and SOP means start of production, where we really want to have the cars rolling to the customers. And before this SOP, which is our holy delivery point, um, we have a so-called DET, which is a data and termin, a very German word, it's a data and date. Um, on this date, every software for each ECU, the flash data containers, flashable in the factory or pre-flashed with the suppliers who ship the actual hardware must be in our systems, in the software management systems. Um, actually, the system is called System 42 in, in uh, Volkswagen. Maybe. We have nothing to do with that. Exactly. So there's no, no coincidence on this one. Um, but somebody had some kind of humor for this. Um, nevertheless, this data needs to be in there so is that you have it ready, um, flashable, and available for the whole Verbund, for the whole connected uh, ECUs in the, in the vehicle. That's for sure. And the 1.2 is the current SOP um, for the premium platform. Um, where Audi and Porsche having the cars there. This is high time where all hands on deck are at Carriot currently fighting to get all the nitty gritty details uh, out of the, of the software to really have a robust stable thing. So to, to summarize for, um, for, for myself, right? Um, Volkswagen is building a, its car operating system and they want to build the 2.0, the full, fully new version uh, that's you know, coming out in a couple of years. And uh, the 1.2 is taking some aspects, like it's the current one, but it's bringing some aspects that are actually developed for the new operating system already in this current one, especially for the premium, meaning Audi and Porsches are going to have um, this new software suit. Did you Not fully correct? Uh, not fully correct. There is already stuff that was aimed and developed and deployed for one or two for, already by with colleagues. So okay, to but, not but that to will continue credit where credit is into the new one. Did your team um, actually write um, uh, parts of um, uh, what is what is coming in there? A very close colleague of me. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. And so that's yeah. work from uh, um, neighboring a couple teams. of months or a um, oh, couple nah, of years already. A couple of years work. That is uh, going into that. It must be wonderful to actually see that the software is like going out, right? You're not just writing it and testing it. And um, sure, it, it 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 gives all engineers a certain pride, you know. And you see this throughout the whole company as well as the brands, you know. When when you talk to people who who worked on the, just yesterday I, I spoke to one of the safety guys uh, working on the um, pedestrian saving. Uh, uh, emergency brake assistant. You know, these people take real high pride in having done proper engineering and seeing the cars sent out there and uh, knowing about their own contribution. That's, uh, yeah, definitely the same. Very, very cool. So at the center of um, your map or um, central in your map, I guess, um, you had the um, software defined vehicle. Mm -hmm. And um, those of uh, you who are uh, following what we are doing, we um, recently had an event with Michael Plage from the Eclipse Foundation that hosts the Software Defined Vehicle to announce that we're looking to do a strategic partnership. And, uh, you know, guess what? Uh, Tom and, and I and uh, some of the others uh, obviously talked before, and um, we think it's a good idea. Why do you think it's a good idea? And um, of course, also, where uh -huh. do you um, see challenges? What, what should um, we all be looking out for? Uh -huh. I think it's a great opportunity because um, 
if you look what automotive did in the past, especially the OEMs, the rest of the industry already was there using and partly as well contributing to open source. But especially if you look on the software savvy OEMs and pretty much all of them are taking steps to own more software and getting their stuff together. Um, it's a great opportunity for us in the market to collaborate, not just between industries, but as well with universities, with education, and gives people who are learning the ability to look and touch the real software that later on will drive in the car, which formerly was potentially possible if you did an internship at one of the software companies, which actually brought me into the automotive industry, which is a good thing, and I advise you to do that. Um, but it as well allows you to touch, for instance, the tools we are using to define the vehicle network of the future, which we're intending to open source at Eclipse Foundation as well, called ArchE, and you can already see um, the project proposal for the architecture enabler tooling. And this one will allow you, even as a student, to see, okay, this tool is really the thing with a professional in-vehicle network is being defined. That's something which formerly was not accessible to you. Um, and you could write a test, uh, a test generator or you could write a code generator to uh, deal with the data that is there on the bus systems um, and yeah, dive into the topics that are formerly like uh, hidden to us as an industry. So we are, of course, a little bit um, preaching to each other, preaching to the, the choir. We, we, we think that um, uh, the, the openness of that code is, of course, great for um, uh -huh. you as students, for all learners, actually. There, there is the saying, if you can't open it, you don't own it, right? For me, it just makes a lot of sense to have as little black box in those technologies as possible. Mm -hmm. um, uh, things like uh, many eyes, shallow bugs, right? Uh, just create better quality software and that seems particularly relevant when it comes to safety and security right something where we shouldn't um, uh, focus on the the top top branch let's say porsche of course has a really really good um, safety and security system but they are actually only as safe as the crazy vehicle right next to them that might be much much cheaper mm -hmm. so if um, that other vehicle gets a security upgrade a safety upgrade that's actually good for everyone right so i think uh, from several perspectives, um, it is particularly relevant in, in those spaces, but there's also uh -huh. the infrastructure stuff that um, it's just not a differentiator, right? Nobody um, will buy a car because it runs operating system kernel function X, Y, Z. And so to share um, these share, um, functions yeah. across all players is, is quite meaningful. And to see um, that I think we see um, you're better up to date into who officially joined um, the CDV uh, now, but we're seeing more and more um, uh, mobility players um, come in there. I had a conversation earlier with um, IAV. They mm -hmm. just joined, yep. I think, yesterday or so. Um, so really good to, to see that. Hopefully, we're betting on a train that is just leaving the station, and you know, you guys can all hop on. And uh, we invite, of course, everybody uh, here and international to consider joining us here in Wolfsburg and in that yep. venture. But you wanted to to come in. I wanted to interrupt you on the safety thing. Um... For, for system safety uh, and for safety software development, the bar is a little bit even more higher than like- Well, because software, the you thing know? is going 200 kilometers per hour, yeah. 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 And, and, and kind of developing code in a safety system, basically you could kind of boil it down. We have to follow the ISO norm and everything should be that. Um, and this is typically what, you, what is hard to find out in the open source world, you know, following the ISO standards for uh, so very, very stringent uh, development processes for each of your submits being 4i documented, competent reviewers being done. That is tough, you know, and uh, having the whole uh, C1, C2 code coverage for every line in, in the high AC level system. This is really tough and hard to find in an open source project, but there are good examples as well where you find like operating systems, like a free Artos, where you as well get a safe Artos, which has just the same APIs, um, but all the safety manuals and certification there. Um, so for safety, the, the bar and the challenge in open source is still much higher and there's more way to go. 
for us uh, as an industry to use safety software and have safety software in open source manner. That's really a, a tough story. There are industry players who are now working on getting a Linux safety certified, at least to a certain level. Um, so let's see, there is, there is more, more to the game to come. Well, there's an obvious, um, uh, not contradiction, but um, uh, challenge that obviously when you want something certified, then it's in the current state, right? You get a certain state certified. And then um, uh, what you do in software is you basically iterate and update all the time. So um, I, I do think that um, uh, there, there are significant architectural um, uh, challenges. And again, you know, because it is so complex, it makes sense to share those um, parts, uh, that burden. Um, I thought that you were going to um, uh, use this um, moment to speak a little bit about Rust, because I know that's um, one of the elements that uh, improves the um, safety or productivity, I guess, the, the, the uh, yeah, good yeah. code. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, we, most of my team actually love Rust and uh, all what is that. Rust. Uh, most of my team loves Rust, which I guess everybody here knows. I see it in the smile. I, I think, I think we should describe it. There's people also on the internet um, uh, that might not know. <laughs> okay, um, so it's easy to say. Rust is a programming language invented by some Mozilla guys a um, couple of years ago. Not really old, but already grown, uh, a grown up, so to say. Um, a systems programming language, which you could run bare metal, build servers in, run in um, WebAssembly in your browser and kind of along the whole line of use cases, you could apply Rust. It's hard from fighting the compiler in a way um, because the compiler already prevents you to do some dirty shit. Um, so like race conditions, uh, it has a static type system. Um, and uh, most of my team in their past life had the chance to shoot themselves in the foot um, by using C++ or C. Um, therefore, or doing it now, you know, and they actually uh, for themselves decided now nah, this foot shooting this is not fine, you know, this, this nightly bug session searching, it's, it's not nice and uh, Rust comes with a, uh, with a packaging system with cargo, um, with, uh, where, with all the tools you actually want as a developer, so and is as well a very friendly developer ecosystem, and we found out by developing in Rust, testing it on hardware, that it actually has clear benefits for us as carried in automotive embedded and robust software. And interestingly, there are as well players from the top-notch safety industry who we will soon see joining the Rust Foundation. Um, and uh, there is as well work ongoing, even though the Rust compiler is very often uh, being updated in the language as well, like these rolling updates. <clears throat> but there is work ongoing and it's not a secret um, from the guys in Berlin around Florian Gilcher to get the Rust compiler safety certified where they're working together with other core. And then the story is really getting interesting. There are potentially others as well on uh, embedding Rust in their systems. Um, I think you see stuff here from BlackBerry as well. Um, and that makes Rust a very interesting, sure not again a silver bullet, you know, without engineering, forget about it. Um, you just write code that it's, it's good for the waste bin. So don't forget about the engineering. But if you do engineering and you do it in Rust, it could be a very, very interesting tool for us as automotive industry, for carrier especially. I spoke to Ansgar as well about it here in the call, camera switched off, that we all see it has clear benefits for us in the automotive industry. Um, yeah. Little, little teaser, there is a, a great Rust team in, in Berlin and uh, we're looking to, to get in touch and get them over here. I think that's the type of tech that um, you should think about, learn about, and uh, you know, basically, um, I think they call it leapfrogging, right? Um, uh, we ask you to start with C really bare bones, but then obviously um, we want you to jump to the absolute most current stuff that is used in, in industry and uh, with top engineers. So that's uh, something that we are looking for. 
Uh, now you made a comment that um, uh, totally spontaneously creates a question. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. Um, but uh, I also want to use the opportunity. We're I think now ready to to open it up. Um, uh, you know, we uh, don't have to do only uh, audience questions. But if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, or if you're online, uh, raise your hand there. If we don't see you. Um, you know, make yourself heard. Um, it's a it's a fairly small environment. So the, the question that I uh, wanted to throw at you when you said, well, the, the tech needs to be good, but the engineering is the most important. Of course, um, one, I, I thought about the uses of uh, AI and uh, the most obvious now chat GTP, right? For writing emails, for all kinds of things that it's being used. I have to admit, it uh, didn't occur to me until uh, so someone here at 42 told me, well, you can actually also ask the thing to write you some code, right? And uh, to what degree, uh, like how do you define the human creativity, the expertise aspects, if you just want functioning code, right? I mean, you basically give it uh, what you want and you, you give it the it tests. Was, I mean, do you really have to understand every single line that it's that is written there? Um, is was, that something that you thought about? Is it, oh uh, yeah, um, sure. Uh, I mean, if you if you follow what the Chaos Computer Club, the net community, uh, all that is doing, there was an interesting post, I think two, three weeks ago from a professor in AI and engineering and he actually found out that if you just type what you need for a for a matrix op operation um uh one of these code um what was it i think the github or uh one of these code um, assistants who uses ai to code for you out of what they think you intend to do used exactly code licensed under a certain open source license by this professor and without the license without the attribution that code showed up in your ide when you just said okay i want this kind of matrix operation um, and that actually is a problem because uh, you know this guy put in effort he released it under a very permissive license the, you you take these AI auto completion functionality, put it in proprietary code. Um, basically, you have uh, infringed copyright laws because you put it in proprietary stuff and changed it without giving it back. That's kind of a problem in this way. It could as well be a problem in the other way if they train the AI model on proprietary code, uh, not intended for the public. So it's a two way problem on this. You know, it's like. Uh, uh, Good, good point. I hadn't yeah. thought of the, the um, licensing issues. Uh, my my observation would be you want to have as little black box as possible. And yeah. so if you have whatever create a lot of code and yes, you know, input output uh, seems to match, but you have no idea what it's actually yeah, yeah. doing. So uh, yeah, I mean, depending AI on how important <laughs> the the software is, you know, whether yeah. it's controlling is, um, a moving object or whatever so it might there is be, a reason, not a good idea. There is a reason podcast I, I, I recommend to everybody uh, listening. It was Millie Cummings, mm -hmm. new safe, senior safety advisor on the NHTSA. Uh, we speak at NHTSA, but it's the NHTSA. It's the National Traffic and Highway Association in the U.S. And she's actually, a, I think it's a prime example for women in tech as well. She was a jet a fighter pilot, and she's now safety senior safety advisor to the traffic overseeing organization in the US. And she just recently gave a podcast about AI in autonomous systems, which if you follow the norm and you look for the highest safety standards, AI is forbidden. If you think on C and D, you should not use, you know, it's highly disregarded to use it there because you need predictable controllability in this system. So you shouldn't do it um, for perception. Like you get image data and you want to find out it's, is it Marks or Tom or is the kid or a, or a wall? Um, yeah, you, you can't come around it, but you need additional passes, additional sensor data, like a uh, leader, a radar, in addition to sensor, fuse it and really make sense out of the data with predictability. So just using AI, where you said, I trained it. Who tells you that your model is real? It's just generating probabilities. We will never know 100% for sure for that. So the podcast could be an interesting one. I think it's Millie Cur Cummings, NHTSA, just recently out. Very cool. On SoundCloud. 
Very cool. So um, as our active listeners um, and um, participants are thinking about their questions, we can come to a, a nice part of these fireside chats. That is um, where we ask you for your recommendations for our manual for happy software engineers. As I um, uh, explained, we are looking for the best thousand books that um, uh, software engineers should um, uh, read uh, in order to be excellent software engineers and importantly, in order to be happy. Where's, so, um, uh, where, where is uh, his Where's bag? my backpack actually? I, I, Let's see. I had two books with me in the train and I just managed to... No, I mean, oh, yeah, it's, right, here it's it right here. Right here, perfect. It's on the espresso machine's vicinity. Yeah, for um, happy software developers, good books. Ooh. I would recommend first, and I don't have that with me, and I didn't know you asked for books. Um, Agile, the hype, and the ugly is a good one. Um, Agile, the hype, and the ugly. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, telling you, uh, he, he's laughing. Yes, yeah, so that is really a good one. Telling you about don't. Telling you about the real good stuff about the source and true parts of Agile, which actually meant that developers understand users, talk to them, have a feedback cycle, <laughs> iterate, and not about that's not what it's known for, right? <laughs> it's it's not so much also, but you know, uh, and some of the practices uh, that Agile is preaching, I would say, are a malpractice if you build a distributed safety system which can drive up to two hundred kilometers an hour. So some of this stuff, like neglecting the upfront architecture works that is required, is really not a good thing to do. Um, that book is really an awesome read. Um, uh, it's as well it's the good parts. You know, it, it really highlights the good parts, the ugly parts, and the stuff that is a freakish advice for engineers. So you should definitely read that as well in an industry which is over agile hyping things. You know, in general, I think whole tech industry is full of hype technology. Um, and hype process stuff as well. So be careful. And um, that's, I think, a very good one. Um, I don't have it with me because I was just recently lending it out. Um, this one is potentially a good one. Will Larsen, an elegant puzzle. And you see it from the bookmark. I'm just starting to read it. One of my guys, Yuri, recommended it to me. It's about engineering management in tech. Systems of Engineering Management. Very good one. I will learn a lot about that. So I'm humble here. It could be a good one. And actually, here's a Kindle, you know, but it's still, um, it's kind of, where is the secondary one? Ah, here. <laughs> This one is as well a very good one for all of us in automotive. How safe is safe enough from Phil Koopman? Measuring and predicting autonomous vehicle safety. So it's really about the society impact, the safety performance indicators that you should have in order to deploy an autonomous system with the right awareness for acceptable safety um, to the greater public. So that's um, nice to read. Um, if you're new to the subject, you will do a leap in learning about autonomous vehicle safety. Um, yeah, that's a good read as well. And Phil Koopman is uh, yeah, one of the very respected um, safety guys in the industry. Um, therefore, my team works on Linux. The stuff I do is QM, so non-safety software. But nevertheless, it's just interesting reads uh, because the whole industry is talking and working a lot towards autonomous vehicles good read to have um, like information hygiene and to know things, you know, competence always helps. Cool. So um, uh, I'm lo looking for hands for the first brave Zolt to um, uh, break the ice and um, uh, Maybe also just a, a reminder, uh, Tom did join us as um, uh, senior fellows and uh, he did mention that, um, uh, you know, mentoring, speaking with um, uh, uh, students, and, you know, just reflecting on uh, possible career paths, uh, technologies, et cetera, is something that he'd be open to. So um, maybe work up your, um, uh, 
your motivation, your courage, and uh, and think about contacting using the opportunity that is he that he is here in 3D. Um, afterwards, uh, we're also um, looking to onboard some of the engineers in his team as fellows um, who. Um, hopefully become regulars with Pratik, with um, CME42 mobility, et cetera. Um, when you just spoke about uh, the, the safety um, uh, in autonomous driving, I um, couldn't resist to make the uh, connection to uh, um, air traffic. I have to say that while, yes, you know, uh, there's claim, uh, plane crashes, uh, when you see the amount of flights that are happening every day around the world, it's minuscule compared to um, what's going on on the streets. For obvious reasons, I'm not saying that is a one-on-one -on -one comparison, but what I do find um, uh, interesting is that uh, what we touched earlier, uh, the safety standards, right? The, the certification is extremely high. And uh, what I find uh, interesting and I would like to ask your opinion about is um, the maintenance of these planes is also incredible. I mean, the safety checks almost not every day, but um, uh, mm -hmm. I would say every couple of days, every plane uh, almost has a complete check of, uh, you know, are all the parts where they should be, right? You, you physically check whether they're there, you have the safety checks. Is that something that, um, is going to be um, easier in cars that are software defined because um, you know you continuously monitor the, the systems and you can even go as far as predicting uh, before something breaks, stuff like that. Or do you think, which for me seems an equally valid um, uh, observation that this is such a complex system, right? That uh, butterfly effect type of thing, right? Somewhere a couple of bytes go wrong and uh, it uh, propagates and screws up the whole system. How do you uh, so yeah, architect for that, uh, for safety in such an environment? I'm obviously not an expert. You've, um, you're you know, in the middle. I, I need to be humble here as well because I'm not, the competent safety expert i may appear you know <laughs> to the outsider that i know something but i know i know not um so you definitely try to tackle this but first to your questions the latter definitely is what i think because if you look on airspace there is a certain if you fly planes like uh at a certain like 360 degrees you can fly so if you fly this one area like south Sassan, you fly in the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 mm -hmm. meter height. And the other ones fly in 1,500, 2,500. So the, the chance to directly hit and, uh, and get you is uh, already diminished by organizational measures uh, mm -hmm. in flight planning. Therefore, these planes definitely have a couple of seconds time to react. Just think of what happens in a couple of seconds driving 160. Uh, so it's the reaction time of the system, um, and if you think of a crowded uh, city where you drive autonomously, and you potentially, who watched Super Bowl? Who watched Super Bowl advertisements? <laughs> okay, I, you know, I, I should not, and I will not talk about competitors, um, but I recommend you to watch one, two of the Super Bowl commercials. Just search YouTube and you'll find what I mean. Um, it's definitely an, a hard engineering task to get this done with uh, um, FMEA, so the failure mode effect analysis with hazard analysis to really rigorously engineer such a, such a system to be safe. You know? It's not a piece of cake. Otherwise, we would all already drive autonomous. And you know what I would do with which I have if I had an autonomous car which runs on batteries which I charged from my roof. So let's say CO2 neutral autonomous car. When I just step by for 42 for, let's say, half an hour, here we are now longer, I would not even search a park spot. I would have the car drive around the block, you know, um, autonomously um, and just search for the next traffic jam to kind of uh, <laughs> put, put itself in line there. So there will be interesting society effects of these things to come. Um, to deflect from your safety question. Yeah, but that is a really funny um, thought, actually, to find the next traffic jam to put your car just in. Just think of New so York. So you don't downtown. have to look for um, uh, parking spots. 
Uh, do you believe um, uh, there will be fully autonomous um, uh, level five in um, Europe? I think one of the differentiations I would make that I've heard that made sense to me is it's one thing to drive a fully autonomous somewhere in the desert or even in uh, the US, right? Where the streets are all lined up, there's much more space compared to you know a village in Italy. That uh, seems much more crazy um, yeah. to organize from a software perspective. I think belief is the hard um can i ditch this question and we get a question from the <laughs> audience <laughs> okay wonderful i think yeah. an engineering belief and hope driven development is not a good thing you know yeah uh, therefore maybe we have questions gotcha. from the audience i like that uh, also online um who um wants to come in i yeah just uh unmute maybe say your name wh whatever other qualifier you want to uh, share whether you are a student or where you work. Oh, on the chat. Ah, yeah. oh, it's on the chat. Do you follow a specific lean development cycle? Question from Ajoop. Um, you? I, I, I maybe got your name wrong. Sorry for, for that, you? I apologize. Um, we do follow a scaled agile framework to some extent. Solution management, several release trains, which we try to organize to work in. Um, yeah. But still, I recommend this one book, which I recommended first to read. And um, one way to uh, um, mitigate risks that come from uh, highly complex systems and, uh, you know, environments that. Uh, you, you want to um, be effective and safe is, um, I believe, decentralization and really having the intelligence sit at the end is what uh, the original internet architect said, right? Not uh, try to have uh, the, the network control everything, but uh, empower the, the individual nodes to make um, small, uh, smart decisions. How is um, the, the planning in such a big um, uh, software development effort, like what you, that you're involved in. Um, I think this was specific to your team, right? If you go That's up it. a level, um, how can you plan out software? I mean, I was amazed to hear 2026, uh, 2027, right? Several years out. Um, uh, in, so you, uh, this, this is, uh, might be secret sauce part as well, but um, uh, whatever you can share, I, I think that would be super interesting for us to understand. I think there is as well no magic or silver bullet behind that, you know. Um, and uh, in automotive time cycles, you always have this thing that um, before you can bring a car to the road, you need rough, you pretty much need two winters in order to do the winter testing of the car. So if every uh, you know, you could have stuff happen in your vehicle if you cool it down to 40 degrees for, let's say, 48 hours. That's a ball grid array of a certain processor uh, shrinks to a factor that you get uh, sometimes disconnected and uh, certain strange bugs. Um, this you will only find out either in winter or heat summer testing, so to say. Therefore, these vehicles need to be taken out for winter and summer testing to drive them in these conditions. Not so much because we like to drive to, to kind of um, do drifting on ice and snow, you know, or in Sahara, um, but it's really to have these rough conditions where our drivers as well need to have reliable products. Um, and this puts forward a certain amount of timeline though. You can't take a car for winter testing if heating is not working if uh, climate control is not working, if you can't unlock the doors and unlocking the doors kind of involves, for the test you may skip it, but it involves as well having the secret key handshake with your mobile key done and stuff like that, because you don't want to open it with a screwdriver like a, a car seat, you know? Well, there is a certain uh, functionality roadmap behind going into these winter tests early enough. Um, and that is sure, so there is a, an enormous amount of planning output from the overall system that you need to have there in order to have this vehicle network being stable and robust in order to get this stuff done. Um, the thing which we are working on as well with Carrier to our regaining certain control points in the software architecture is that functionality that formerly was only 
kind of bought in with the hardware and the ECU. And kind of in order to have the functionality again, you need to write an RFQ or a request for quote, ask somebody to redevelop you the same software that you already had on a different ECU so that you again have this functionality. This is, is something we want to change in a way that if we own this software, we can just port it, you know, we still have to port it potentially, but we can own it and we can port it um, to a new generation of chip, to a new generation of a Linux kernel, to a new generation of uh, an RTOS uh, system, and as well have this high invest in this functionality that you as a driver really see, um, taken over from generation to generation and evolve on that one. So here is a planning effort, not a small one, and uh, there are different solution trains really trying to reach these milestones in order to get the cars ready, you know? Well, I'm tempted to ask more questions, but um, uh, we have uh, Pratik, um, uh, our um, uh, CME lead here, who I know was um, uh, scratching to ask a question. Alex, if you have one, um, uh, please now, we're, we're going, oh, we're almost out. Um, so uh, if you have one, uh, raise your hand now. First, over to you, Pratik. I think this question also uh, represents the students um, uh, or general question. Uh, what would be the easiest entry point uh, for uh, a techie or a, a programmer to enter into the world of mobility software engineering, automotive software engineering? If you look on the metro map, pick any point, I'd say. Um, if you want to work with us directly, could be that you... Um, reach out to us or to the, as well, Eclipse SDV working group, even on the mailing list to say who you are and um, touch and look into the open source software that we're putting out there. Uh, my developers already thinking about what could be good student tasks to hand out to the 42 guys. Um, why, uh, for instance, combining our some IP stack with the Cuxaval project and doing something there on a small car or uh, writing certain other software around that. So my guys are already thinking, guys and girls, uh, already thinking about uh, what could be done, what is interesting and still challenging and doable for a student where we can do the mentoring with developers for other techies, that is a good entry point. But in order to enter the world of mobility software, could be the backend, could be deeply embedded, could be diagnostic, could be anything on this map. And if you need a deep dive into one of these train stations, just reach out to me. I'm actually findable on LinkedIn, definitely, and uh, happy to go in contact here. Actually, I'm searching for, uh, maybe you have some relatives, friends in your network. Let me do this advertisement. You did advertisement on the very beginning, Max. I'm currently looking for a senior C++ engineer who as well loves Rust, but is seasoned in C++ as an extension uh, to my team, as well to the audience here. Um, on the on the screens, not sure who is styled in, um, but yeah, we're looking to strengthen the team. Awesome, more more than welcome to uh, do a little advertisement, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, everybody. I hope um, you enjoyed the, uh, this first conversation um, uh, between us uh, here a lot. Um, uh, I would love to retract more and more in these conversations. Tom, you're essential, but um, you know, um, next time you, you see Tom on, on the menu, um, uh, you already know he's um, easily accessible, informal. Um, uh, think about um, what conversations we, we should have. We will definitely um, continue our conversations about how 42 can contribute to um, the um, brave new world of next um, uh, generation software defined vehicles. For today, I thank all of you for your interests and your questions, and um, especially Tom. I hope it's the first of many visits. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, love to be here. It's it's really awesome. Where just uh, kind of uh, Max showed me where you work, where you code, where it's really cool. Next time I bring enough time to have a session of uh, Mario Kart with you. Yeah, or, or some hands-on um, uh, coding. 
Um, uh, yeah, really, really good. Thank you. Um, see you um, uh, here in Wolfsburg. See you online. Um, uh, see me space is the place to find out about uh, the new um, uh, training program that we'll start in July. And um, uh, yeah, I hope we, were, we are um, uh, easily accessible and contactable. Have a good day. Cheers, guys. Thank you.